This is Kurt Ullum, and he is Director of Engineering at Airtex Fuel Systems. I'd asked him to uh, walk through the different components of a fuel pump, and he was kind enough to give us this breakdown. Okay, we're going to be discussing in detail what we would normally think of as uh, normal pump construction, normal pump operation, normal pump performance. So as we start off here with a uh, slightly disassembled pump with the back end cut open to show you the pumping section. We're going to walk through from the inlet of the pump, which would normally have a filter unit on it like this. It's going to filter the incoming fluid and in most cases it's going to be nestled inside the reservoir of your in-tank fuel module. So as we accumulate and build up fuel in this holding reservoir, then the pump will pick it up from the inlet end. So to break that down, <coughs> this pump has been pulled completely apart. The outer shell, the part the customer normally sees, has been set over here to the right hand side. Of course is the fuel again, normal progression of the fuel, we're going to be pulling it once the pump is energized with the electricity. The armature is going to turn inside the magnet assembly and it in turn is going to turn or power the pumping section which in this case is a combination of a roller vane pumping element with a pre-primer turbine or impeller unit. So we're going to be pulling in fuel through the strainer. It's going to make its way through the inlet which also has a small micron stainless steel screen in it to help prevent any further contamination from entering the pump. We're going to pre-prime the system with the flow from this impeller and eventually we're going to feed that fuel up here to what we're calling this roller vane sandwich sub-assembly. <clears throat> and this is where the real work and pressure of the pump happens. We're going to build pressure and flow with the rotating roller and rotor elements inside that pumping subsection. These are what we call flow-through pumps by design. We pull the fuel in through the inlet and the filter. It flows from one end of the pump completely through the pump including passing through the magnet subassembly and the rotating armature. And now this armature, uh, this particular armature may rotate somewhere between uh, 3,000 and 3,500 RPM. But as that fuel is being pumped from the, uh, the working end of the pump, it's going to pump it through there. Uh, it acts again as a, not only the fuel flow, but it also helps cool and lubricate the pump. And, uh, of course, that has to do with all the rotating elements inside the pump. We get down here to what we call the discharge or outlet into the pump. This is the actual brush holder and outlet housing. Inside of that, we're going to have a couple of valves and seats. One side, we have what we call the check valve, which is what holds the pressure in the line in the system on the vehicle once the power is turned off to the pump. The other side is a relief valve, uh, which, depending on how the fuel uh, flow and pressure regulated on the vehicle make sure that we don't over exceed the pressure in the system so for instance if we've got a 50 psi regulator in this system we'll have a relief valve that's designed to open up right about that same threshold so we don't actually over pressurize the system on the vehicle and damage something downstream now here's a cutaway on this end normally these uh, terminals and brushes would be mounted again inside this plastic part but this is actually where we transfer the uh, electrical input voltage from the system through the terminals, through the brushes, and eventually to the interface between the brush and commutator on the armature. And of course that's where you get your rotation from. Okay, here at Airtex we uh, primarily use uh, three types of pumping elements. Most automotive applications are we're going to use what we call a regenerative style turbine. In this particular case, the rotating member is a one-piece engineering polymer plastic part. Uh, nice thing about turbines, they're nice and quiet. They do have to turn at a higher RPM level to gain the efficiency they need, so they're a little bit more prone to contamination damage if it happens. Again, extremely tight clearances between the, uh, the housing elements and the rotating turbine. Also use what some people call a gear pump or a gyrotor pump. In this particular case, this is a gyrotor cutaway. We've got the outer ring gear and we've got an inner rotating gear. Uh, not quite as quiet as the turbine. Still a little bit quieter than a roller vane. But again, the tight clearances or the tip clearance on the gear set 
uh, can be somewhat prone to issues associated with contamination. That one looks very similar to an oil pump. Very similar to oil pumps. Uh, most of the crank driven oil pumps nowadays are Gerotor sets. This is just a lot smaller. Most of our larger pumps for heavier duty applications, uh, automotive, truck, agriculture, and so on, we use what's called a roller vane pump. It's comprised of a rotor element with actual rolling elements that go inside pockets, either five or six slot pocket rotor. As the pump rotates on an eccentric cam, uh, those rollers move in and out, and as they do, of course, that causes the pumping action of the fuel. Uh, heavier duty pump, inherently because of the number of rotating parts, they generate a little bit more noise than a turbine, but they are much more adept at handling uh, higher contamination levels. Very robust, you would say? Yes, this is uh, what we actually use in a lot of cases for most of our heavy duty diesel OEM applications. In the case of just about every pump we make, we've got, again, the uh, check valves in place, and we also have the relief valves. What does the check valve do? The primary purpose for the check valve is to ensure that once you shut the power off to the pump and it stops turning, that we maintain consistent pressure in the downstream fuel line. So uh, the it, idea being that when the customer goes out in the morning, they key on the ignition, they don't want to have to sit there and wait uh, for the system to pressure up for the engine to start. So what might be some ways of finding like a, a bad check, or what might be some symptoms of a bad check valve? Usually, usually the one and, and, and primary symptom is the fact of long crank. You go out in the morning, your car will start, but it may take 10, 20, 30 seconds of cranking time for that thing to finally build up enough pressure to go ahead and fire off the engine. That usually means that overnight the check valve has leaked off and you've lost all your downstream pressure. And say, for instance, I was to, to verify this with an actual test with a fuel pressure gauge and I had my fuel pressure gauge on the system, about how long would be a normal bleed off, or about how long could I wait looking at that fuel pressure to see if, it, if that check valve was working That's properly. a hard one to answer because considering what the failure mode may be and how bad the leak rate is, it could leak off in as little as a half an hour, it may take eight hours. Right. It's just, it's very dependent on the, the situation. Yeah, if there's a little piece of crud in there, something really small that's not like A piece of sand or some yeah. kind of debris that gets caught between, say, the ball and the valve seat, and it's just minimal, minuscule, it may take hours. If you've got one where maybe the rubber element's gone completely bad, it could leak off almost within, you know, 10, 20, 30 minutes. Okay, everything we've discussed to this point about the pump, and again, to give you the proper relationship of where it would be in your system, uh, this is what we call a normal in-tank module. Most of the time the customer only sees what's from the tank out, which would be this top flange assembly, which is where your electrical connections, your tank vapor sensor, and your fuel lines would be. Actually inside the tank would be the rest of this then, and down here in what we call the reservoir cup itself, in addition to having your float or your fluid level sensor mounted inside that reservoir cup is another smaller cup, and that's where your pump is actually located. Uh, it's meant to be in here, it's pre-filtered as far as fuel contamination and as that reservoir maintains a certain level of fuel inside the cup, that's where the pump's going to draw a lot of its primary fuel from. My thanks to Kurt Ullum for showing us around uh, the fuel pumps and how they're put together and the different types and everything else. I learned quite a bit there. Um, and also thanks to the people at Airtex uh, for letting me come out and talk to these people. So. Uh, be safe, have fun, and stay dirty, kids. Thanks for watching.